Hey there art nerds! I know you guys love mushroom art, so I created this start to finish tutorial based around a mushroom capped girl. If you're one of my patrons on Patreon, you have access to the printable line art, so if you don't feel like drawing along and you just want to relax and paint, head on over to patreon.com slash soup. So, I hope you guys are ready to sketch, draw, ink, and paint. Grab your pencils, grab your favorite inking pens, grab your brushes and your paints, and let's get started. I'm working from a very loose thumbnail sketch in my sketchbook, and I'm going to be working today in a Canson XL watercolor sketchbook. I'm using the nine by 12 size. I am sketching very lightly using Pentel red lead. I've divided the page in half and I have drawn kind of a semicircle in the center of the page. I'm utilizing constructive figure drawing to start drawing the figure of the girl with the mushroom hat. If you're interested in learning more about how I like to draw figures and how I construct the human form, I have a bunch of tutorials in the playlist, how to draw and paint people. I will link that for you guys down in the description below, as well as link out all of the materials. But basically, I start with a glorified stick figure to kind of figure out the placement of everything and to figure out the pose. And then I use cylinders and spheres to kind of refine the shapes and build up the body. This is a technique that I've been using for over a decade now, and it has really helped me improve my figure drawing and it helps me draw poses from imagination without having to rely entirely on reference. So if you're interested in learning how to draw people, I really recommend you try this method and you check out my playlist to learn how to do so. So once I've got the figure sketched in, I'm gonna start blocking in her clothing. We've already kind of blocked in the hat because her arms are interacting with it, so it's important that we just go ahead and place it early on. But now we can start refining things and we can start sketching in the clothes. And I wanna make it look like the wind is catching the skirt on her dress. So I've done this kind of S-shaped curve. I know it's kind of difficult to see right now. Unfortunately, for me to be able to erase the red lines, I have to sketch them very faintly and my camera has some difficulty with that, which is why I'm not treating this as like a figure drawing tutorial and why I'm referencing my how to draw people playlist. So I'm just kind of blocking in the clothing, figuring things out where as I go along. I am referencing this type of dress just to kind of get the gist for how it works, but I'm going to change and add several elements to just kind of make it my own. So one thing I want to point out is that even though I have a very cartoony art style, I'm a comic artist and uh, my, my work is very heavily inspired by manga and anime, I still really like to reference real world objects to really get an idea for how they look and then caricature it from there. Something that I feel like isn't talked about a whole lot, and maybe I'll do a vlog about it, is that comic artists have to be able to draw everything. We don't get to be specialists. We don't just get to draw flowers or get to draw cars or get to draw animals or draw, get to draw buildings from the exterior or get to draw landscapes. We have to be able to draw everything and relying on reference to help us is a big part of how we're able to draw everything. So comic artists have to be very flexible in their art and how they draw. So once I have kind of the outfit somewhat figured out, sort of sketched in, I am going to start blocking in her face and adding in some of the details. So since she's wearing such a long dress and wearing such a large hat, I wanted to give her shorter hair to kind of add some contrast to the illustration. And because in this from start to finish drawing series, 
I've been trying to show a variety of hair lengths and hair types. Speaking of, if you enjoy start to finish art tutorials like this one, I have a whole playlist of start to finish art tutorials that I hope you guys will check out. If you like mushrooms and cottage core art, I definitely think you'll enjoy that playlist. So once I have everything kind of blocked in, I'm going to start refining it with the red lead of the pencil, tighten, tightening up the details, and adding in further details. I am going to be inking this later on, so everything doesn't have to be 100%, but I find it helpful to do a lot of my thinking and figuring things out in this stage where I can create correct it with just an eraser rather than in inks where since we're going to be watercoloring on top of our inks those are going to be a lot more permanent. To make this outfit more my own I added a little ruffle down at the bottom and I'm also going to add an area of insertion lace. I'm also adding tassels to the overdress that's going to add a little bit more movement because I can have them moving with the wind that's gusting up her skirts. So for the ruffles, you know, I really need to do a tutorial where I just walk you guys through how I draw some of these aspects of clothing. I think I did a live stream a few years ago on how I think about drawing folds and how I handle clothing. And I think it's high time that I do maybe some mini tutorials on how to draw lace and how to draw ruffles, that sort of thing. It's kind of hard to see here, but if that's something that you guys would be interested in seeing me do kind of a deep dive on, let me know down in the comments or reach out to me in my Discord server, The Paint Box. I'll put a link to that down in the description as well. So now that I have finished it up, it is time to go ahead and ink it. I'm using a sheet of white copy paper as kind of a buffer sheet so that I'm not transferring the oils that might be on my hand onto the paper and also so that I'm not smearing the ink all around while it still dries. Unfortunately, that also means I'm covering up some of the illustration which can make it harder to see what I'm doing while I'm inking. I apologize for that. So I am using a Sakura Pigma FB brush pin. This is a waterproof and alcohol marker safe brush pin. I have talked in my other start to finish art tutorials about why I like brush pins and how much I like brush pins and how fun I find them to be for inking. So I'm not really going to dive into that. If you haven't tried one yet, I highly recommend you head out to your nearest brick and mortar art supply store and try playing around with a few different brush pins just to see what you like. But this is one of the two that I really recommend, especially for this kind of mixed media art. Now, if you want colored line arts, Tombow's Fudenosuke brush pins come in several different colors. They are a little bit smaller of a brush than the Sakura Pigma FB and the brush tip itself is a little bit firmer so it may be a good possibility for people who are a little bit more heavy-handed and tend to bear down when they're inking a whole lot. Those come in a lot of fun colors and when you guys see me do colored line art here on the channel that is probably what I'm using. I have found and this is not a universal it is a generalization but pigment-based brush pins and pigment-based fountain pen inks tend to be truly waterproof once they're fully dry and generally I'll let my inks dry for 12 to 24 hours before I erase let's say the graphite underneath them if I used graphite um, and before I will add water to them. So once I finish inking I'm going to scan this line art and that is the coloring page that I'm providing to my patrons. So there is a method to my madness. You could actually go straight in and start watercoloring on top of just your colored lead and that would create a disappearing line art that you can either ink later or you know leave uninked it's really up to you and I have some tutorials on the channel where I walk you guys through the process for that but I really like being able to have a line art that I can share on Patreon it's a nice little extra that allows me to share my art with other people who might want to color along with me or who might be just looking for something relaxing to do to help unwind and it lets me share my art with them in a different way so this is a nice little bonus to me so this video, the whole video has been sped up 
for X. That's about as fast as I feel I can go for these more in-depth start to finish tutorials. It does sometimes make for a longer video like you guys see here, but we're actually moving slow enough that you guys can see what I'm doing and I can narrate on top of it. Typically when I am inking, and I kind of changed what I did for this one because I, so generally if I'm working on an illustration like this, I will pencil it and then I'll ink it almost immediately after while my hands warmed up. Unfortunately for me, my arthritis has been really acting up and I just don't have the big chunks of time right now that I used to. So um, I penciled this and then the next day I inked it. And that means I need to warm up my hand. So what I'm doing is I'm inking, I started with the less important things, the things that if I mess up a little bit, people are far less likely to notice, like some of the mushrooms in the foreground. And then once I feel like my hand has warmed up and I'm pulling the kind of lines I want, I move on to the really important things like her face, because I wanna get those inked before my hand starts to get tired and I start to make mistakes. Because if you make mistakes on the face, it is very noticeable. And since we're going to be watercoloring on top of this, I would really prefer not to have to pull out the correctional fluid to fix my mistakes. In fact, I don't. I will just learn how to roll with my mistakes. And different pieces have different mistakes that I have to make different accommodations for. And it's really very educational learning how to cover up and hide your mistakes in color that you made while you were inking. So <laughs> don't reach for the whiteout or the Copic Opaque White or the white gouache just yet if you happen to make a mistake while you're working. So I mentioned earlier that I am working at 4x speed or rather I have this time lapsed up to 4x speed. I'm actually taking my time inking this rather slowly. Maybe I'm watching some YouTube or I'm watching some comforting <laughs> shows um, or I'm listening to music but basically you want to keep your vibe very chill while you're inking. You don't want to be drinking coffee so generally I do my inking later on in the day when the caffeine has had a chance to kind of wear off. I mean, ADHD so the caffeine doesn't hit quite the same way that it hits other people so I don't get the handshakes from caffeine quite so badly but you want to just kind of chill out relax just kind of sink into the inking and don't try to rush it it's going to take as long as it needs to take and you trying to hurry up and getting it done or you trying to push yourself in ink while your hands really hurt or after a really long day where you feel really tired and wrecked you're just gonna ruin good pencils just take that as your sign to take the day off, take a break and come at it another time. absolutely love how cute this line art turned out. I'm so glad that I can share it with my patrons who want to paint and color along with me. The expression on her face is just so cute and I've been getting a lot, a lot of love for my mushroom art. So you guys can expect to see more mushroom art from me because being the cottage core Lilliputian girly that I am, I am not going to say no to people who want more mushroom art from me. I'm going to say a big old resounding yes. So the next day, 
after I have scanned the illustration, it is time to paint. I am using my mega palette here. Those of you who hang out with me here on the channel probably saw me build this thing. It's covered in my own vinyl stickers. And I really like vinyl stickers that are actually vinyl. And not to cast shade, but I'm not a big fan of the stickers that are paper, that have contact paper on top of them, because I find those are just not as water safe as actual vinyl stickers. So that's why you guys see actual vinyl, vinyl stickers in my shop and on my watercolor palette. So I am going to use a ceramic weld palette um, and this is so that I can mix up larger amounts of color. And we're going to start with our background. And I want kind of a darker, more moody, gray, bluish gray. So I'm mixing up a Payne's gray. And for that, I am using a base of ultramarine blue with a little bit of burnt umber. And I've also mixed in some Winsor & Newton Payne's gray just to make sure we get that that gray note. I know that sounds obvious, but the thing is with a self-mixed Payne's gray, it's going to granulate out a lot more. So you're going to get that ultramarine blue, you're going to get that burnt umber, but you may not get as much gray as you want. And I really kind of want the best of both worlds. I want that gray undertone and I also want the blue and the brown to kind of complement the mushrooms and the windy day vibes that we've got going on. So that's why I'm using a convenience mix and also actually mixing the color from two of the colors that are typically used to mix a Payne's gray. So I am filling in our background oval with our Payne's Gray mixture all the way to the red circle that we drew around it. And this kind of just creates a vignette effect. I'm also going to use a little bit of the same Payne's Gray on the mushroom stems. I'm going to mix it a little bit more saturated. I'm also adding in a little bit of cerulean blue as well as some sepia because I'm looking to get a little more variation in our granulation and to create a more interesting Payne's Gray mix. Now, if you're painting along with me, whether you drew, inked, and are painting, or you print it out and you're painting, you can use whatever colors you want to use, whatever is inspiring to you. This was just the palette that I chose to use. You can take inspiration from my palette if you wish. You can use whatever watercolors make your heart sing. I am brand agnostic, so I have multiple brands in my palette. I've got Winsor Newton, Daniel Smith, I've got Holbein, I've got Sennelier, I've got some Turner, I've got some Kusakabe, I've got some Da Vinci. I've got some My Marie Blue. So as long as they are professional grade watercolors, they should probably do a great job with this illustration. Now, I am not painting on the best paper. I am painting on a cellulose paper. In fact, I am painting in a watercolor sketchbook. Cellulose paper is not the worst thing to paint on. Um, it definitely has some unique working properties that can make it a lot of fun and can make it quicker and easier than cotton rag paper. So now I'm mixing up kind of a bright yellow green, kind of fishing around for just the right color. And this is going to be our moss. And I'm going to use really small, short, almost like stabby little brush strokes using my rounds. And you guys will probably notice that I'm working mostly with rounds and quills for this illustration. So different watercolor artists have their preferences. And I don't think I'm alone in saying that I really like the round. It is a good all rounder. It's kind of just a workhorse brush that can do a lot of different things. Although I have been experimenting more with other watercolor brushes and I've definitely found some favorites, but nothing quite replaces the round for just versatility. If you're on a limited budget and you can't afford to buy a bunch of different watercolor brushes, rounds are a great place to start. And also you see this huge palette here. You see several brushes here. These were not all bought at the same time. This is a collection amassed over a decade of painting. And I did start out with crummier watercolors and crummier brushes. And I have invested in nicer brushes as I progress on my watercolor journey and as the funds become available. So don't think you have to start with the best, I just recommend that you start with the best that you can afford at the time 
knowing that you'll probably need to upgrade it later on. So I have mixed up a darker mix of our kind of bright springy green. I've also mixed in some Daniel Smith undersea green into the mixture as well. That is a super granulating green. That is a combination of several base granulating colors. It's a convenience mix and I go for it all the time when it comes to painting moss because I just think it's a beautiful color. And I'm using the same sort of little short springy motions, but I'm trying not to cover nearly as much area as when I did the flat fill. I'm adding in a little bit more blue green to the mixture and I'm using that to start dotting in kind of the shadows. So I mentioned that we're working on a cellulose paper today in a watercolor sketchbook. Cellulose paper the paints and the water don't get absorbed into the paper itself. They sit on top of the surface, which means on a rainy day, it may take 1 million years for your watercolor to dry. But on a very dry day, it may dry very quickly. And I try to time these start to finish art tutorials for drier, less humid days. Now, I might live in Southeast Louisiana. We might have really high humidity most of the time, but we also have air conditioning going on in our house. So it's a little bit easier to keep the humidity at a more manageable level when it comes to watercolor. So while I'm waiting for the moss down at the bottom to dry, I'm gonna go in and I am adding some of our gray behind her and then blending it out using clean water. And this is going to create a little bit of a shadow effect and it's going to make the vignette look a little bit more dynamic. It's gonna add a little bit more movement. And I'm blending it out just so that we don't have like a harsh transition line. It's a little bit soft and it's also going to encourage the colors to granulate out a little bit more, which is going to add some more visual interest. Once that background gray has had a chance to dry, I'm grabbing a little bit of ultramarine blue and I'm going to apply it to her eyes, let that dry, and then go in with a little bit more saturated ultramarine blue and apply that to the tops of her eyes beneath the eyelid. And I'm not trying to avoid the iris or anything like that. This is kind of our shadow base for the eyes. So for her skin tone, I'm mixing up a lighter skin tone for this. You can go with whatever colors make your heart sing there is no wrong way to paint her so feel free to mix it up make her look like you if you want to and if you do share it with me I would love to see your takes on this so you can tag me at netto soup n-a-t-t-o-s-o-u-p I believe the skin tone base I went with for her was a little bit of burnt sienna a little yellow ochre and a little bit of scarlet to create kind of a warm but lighter skin tone Obviously, the more of these colors, the more saturated you mix these colors, the more thickly you apply them to her skin, the darker you can go with her skin tone. So feel free to play around with the saturation. For the mushrooms, it looked like I grabbed a little bit of Daniel Smith's old Quinn gold and I am so sorry they discontinued that color it, it has to do with Toyota not offering that color anymore either it was like Toyota gold and they just don't make that color anymore and the pigment industry is really driven by the automotive industry so a lot of what we have available is based on what the automotive industry is buying and and having manufactured and we're moving towards like black red gray and silver cars so I'm a little nervous to see what the pigment industry is going to look like in a few years so for our girl and her outfit and the mushrooms I'm going for a more monochromatic look I decided I was going to go with like a palette of browns, which could go in a variety of directions. It could either look really awesome and very cottage core and very like subdued neutral colors, or it could, <laughs> or it could look bad. And I was worried it was going to look bad. So for her dress, I did a bit of an underpainting with the same color that I used for the mushrooms. I think my camera's kind of skewing it a little bit more yellow than it actually is. And while that's drying, I'm doing another layer of the same color that I originally mixed for her skin tone. So generally the way I think about building up color and building up saturation is twofold. We're building it up through successive layers. So we're glazing one layer on top of the other to 
build up our color and to build up saturation. And we're also using evaporative uh, saturation. So as we're working, the atmosphere is drawing the water out of the well and our colors are slowly becoming more saturated and more condensed. This is a little easier when you're painting like five to six watercolor comic pages at one time because obviously it's going to take so long to get through the whole batch that the colors are going to evaporate more. With a single illustration like this, you're probably going to need to grab more of your base colors and just mix it more saturated and try to match it in tone to, I guess tone is probably not the right word. You want it to be the same color, just more saturated as you go. So for her hat, I am using some burnt sienna with probably a little bit of burnt umber or maybe Van Dyke brown mixed in. I wanted to keep my browns on the warmer, richer side um, so they don't look like poop or they don't run into the possibility of looking like poop. <laughs> See, that was my real fear. I was afraid that it was going to look kind of poopy and I, <laughs> I can make some really terrible jokes. So I'm just going to not. So um, I'm going to use the same color, not just on her mushroom cap, but also on the mushrooms that are around her. I gave everything plenty of opportunity to dry and now we are on to my next painting session. I probably took a break to let my hands rest and kind of recover from the arthritis. So we're going to do our second layer of ultramarine blue at the tops of her eyes, kind of creating the illusion of shadow, like her eyelids are casting a shadow on the tops of her eyes. I've mixed up a little bit of gray here and we're going to start using this on the interior of the mushroom cap to start start painting in the gills to kind of give them some volume and give them some depth so they actually read as mushroom gills. I'm also going to do a little bit of underpainting with the same color on her dress as well just so that we can start blocking in some of the shadows. So with my start to finish series, since we're working on cellulose paper and cellulose paper just can't really take as many layers as a cotton rag paper can, I generally try to simplify what I'm doing with the paints, what I expect of the paints, how I'm handling the paints. And that means really simplifying how I handle the shadows. So rather than using contrasting colors, for some of my shadow work, I'm going to rely on doing grise or I'm going to just use a darker version of the local color, that sort of thing. So me using a gray here, it's because I really wanted to kind of hark to the background and do a little bit of local color here. And I also felt like the dress had gotten a lot too yellow and I wanted to kind of neutralize it a bit and make it appear a little bit more brown. So when it comes to watercolor and color theory, a lot of different artists have a lot of advice. Um, I do think having, you know, a basic elementary to high school understanding of color theory is very beneficial, but I don't think you need to be like a color theory wizard to be good at watercolor. I do think you need to be willing to make some bad art, you need to be willing to make some mistakes, willing to paint some things that you're not the happiest with, and you need to be able to take criticism, both giving it to yourself and not getting overly harsh or being overly easy on yourself, um, but also from other people who you trust and who you may have asked for critique and for advice. So a big part of being an artist is hearing news you don't want to hear that that's going to help you become a better artist. And while you don't have to go to art school to learn how to give and receive critique, it is something that is actually taught at art school. And it's one of the reasons I am somewhat hesitant about allowing artists who proclaim to be self-taught artists to teach me how to do things because I do worry that the ability to give and receive critique may not be entirely there and it might not be as much help as I might like. I may not make as much improvement because they're worried about hurting feelings or because they don't know how to frame what they have to say in a constructive way. So I have mixed up a little bit of a brownish color in our original Quinn Gold pool here in the ceramic palette. And I am glazing that 
over the dress, including over the shadows. So we can warm some of those shadows up and just kind of make them blend in with this illustration a little bit better. I've also decided that I want to give her brown hair and brown eyes kind of leaning in with the mushroom and the brown theme that we've got going on. And I'm just kind of noodling around with the eyes. Um, I found that too much water had pulled in, so I created a thirsty brush and I lifted some of that back out. And I'm still kind of thinking about what I want to do with her overdress. What shade of brown, what kind of brown I want to create for that. But while I'm doing that, I can work on the mushrooms. And I am obviously referencing mo mushrooms. I apologize that I don't know which ones these are off the top of my head. I am sure some intrepid and very generous soul will let everyone know down in the comments below. I have a really bad tendency of Googling like entire groups of things and then picking an aspect like one of those things and not knowing what the specific name of that thing is. I did not go to school for mycology. I do have a lot of biology classes under my belt and I do think mycology is very interesting, but I did not go to school for that. And my memory for that sort of stuff is not super great anyway. So I apologize for that. So I really appreciate whoever in the comments is letting you guys know what these mushrooms are. So I'm using the same color that I'd mixed up to do kind of the shading on the underdress and I'm using that to add shading to the gills on her mushroom cap and I'm kind of following along with those inked crenellations that I did earlier on. I also have this really nice, rich imaldazone red or imaldazone brown in my palette. I believe it's a Holbein color. And this is a nice, almost like a brick brown red. And that's what I'm using to kind of add in some of the darker areas on our mushrooms and her mushroom cap. This is also going to become one of the base colors for her overdress as well. I lied to you guys. Earlier I said I decided to do brown hair, I mean brown eyes. I actually decided to do green eyes using the same green that we use for the moss and that's gonna kind of tie it together. So if you are not super strong with color theory, if you don't really feel confident in your ability to match colors, having a really limited palette and just reusing those colors elsewhere in the illustration kind of helps tie things Things together and it can be a good way to kind of fake seeming like you've got a cohesive color palette or you've got color theory going on. That said, you can also utilize color palette sites like Cooler, K-U-L-E-R, to find cohesive color palettes that you like that you want to use as inspiration for your watercolor adventures. So for her overdress, I am using that imaldazone red and I have mixed that with some Van Dyke brown. So that way it kind of neutralizes it, but we still have some of that really nice warm red going on, really reminiscent of mushrooms out in the woods because that was my goal this entire time is I want this to be kind of a fall vibes illustration, very mushroomy, even though I live in a place where we never really get to have fall. Once upon a time, I lived in Nashville where we had beautiful beautiful fall. So when I need to bring in the fall vibes, I have to channel the time that I spent in Nashville. So I've mixed the color a little bit darker, a little more saturated. Maybe I've even added in a little bit of sepia and I am going to start glazing it on top of that first layer. And I want to leave areas of highlights, areas of that original color. And that's going to give some contrast and some definition to the dress. So it doesn't just turn into kind of like a muddy, shapeless brown blob. The skin tone mix has had a chance to saturate some so I am testing it out down on her feet and it seems like it's a little bit darker so we can bring it up to the arms and her neck and the face. A big 
thing about watercolor and really utilizing a watercolor is when you are adding these successive glazes, please don't cover the same area over and over again. You want to try to cover a little bit less each time and that way you can start building up the light and shadows and contrasts. Speaking of contrast, building up our contrast, whether it's increasing our saturation or moving and mixing um, a different color that's a little bit darker to kind of increase the depth and to shift the color just a little bit as we move away from light and into shadow. That is a super important part of being able to develop form and lighting with your watercolor illustrations. Speaking of, and I should have mentioned this earlier, the light source that I'm imagining this illustration having is actually coming from the upper left. So she's looking into the light source. And I'm trying to keep that in mind as I am creating our light shadow and contrast with this illustration. This is true for a lot of my illustrations. I didn't go into this with a set in stone color plan. I had some idea of what colors I wanted this to use and I wanted to pull inspiration from the reference and I also wanted to reuse the color palette. So um, I'm kind of making some of my color choices as we go along as I've started to apply the color and I'm seeing how it looks and I'm seeing how I feel about it and I'm just kind of adjusting things on the fly. Now some people will do a full color comp and they'll work from that and some people do everything entirely from their gut and on the fly whatever works for you and sometimes it takes experimenting with different methods and you may use different methods for different pieces that's all valid i'm just being very honest with you guys i did not go into this with like a super set in stone color palette i just knew i wanted to use browns grays and greens and that i really wanted to rely on my reference for color inspiration so um i've started introducing pops of imeldazone red maybe mixed with a little bit of alizarin crimson to give us a much more red brown and i'm starting by introducing that on her shoes but i'm also going to work it into the lace insert and right now the lace insert is the same brown as her dress and it just reads as non-existent it just reads as super muddy and difficult to read so i'm kind of thinking about that while i'm applying the shadow layer and um, just kind of adding in some shadow using the gray for the tassel and for some of the billows in the dress itself. Finally, it is time to commit to a hair color. And I decided to go with a reddish brown for this one to kind of contrast with the gray of the background while still going with our brown color scheme. At this point, we have everything kind of blocked in. I have everything kind of figured out. I know what colors things are going to be for the most part. So most of what we're doing from here is saving this from the ugly phase. And one of the ways we can do that is by creating more drama and contrast and cleaning up details. And one of the areas I want to kind of focus on is doing that with her skin and building up that shading with the skin so that she's not so bleached out and so that we get more of an impression of the light source. So for things to actually look bright, you need to have really strong shadows. Bright light is kind of defined by its darkness and it's that contrast that kind of gives us that bounce, that push and pull that indicates lighting. So if you want to paint a sunny day, you're going to have to also paint some harsher cast shadows and you're also going to have to develop some really saturated colors as you work away from the light source. For the trim on her dress, I decided to go with a Quinn Gold and add just kind of a pop of brightness and that'll kind of contrast against how dark brown her dress is going to get. And it's also going to add a little bit more color and liveliness into this illustration.
At this point, it's time to start building up our contrast and adding in some layers and some glazes. So on a cellulose paper like this, I don't really want to try shifting the color too much by glazing additional colors on top of it. Color pigments on cellulose paper, even high quality professional grade pigments can slough off. So if you want to be able to do loads of glazes and color shifts and color adjustments utilizing glazes, I would recommend that you use a cotton rag for those kind of illustrations. This is meant to be just more of kind of a fun laid back sketchbook illustration. So I'm going to primarily lean on same color different saturation glazes where if the color did slough off we wouldn't even notice it because we're just glazing more of that same color so we can't necessarily see if the brush is really lifting the color another point is i am working with either mixed brushes so synthetic and natural fibers or full natural fiber brushes i'm working with fairly soft squirrel hair brushes for this illustration so it's much less likely to kind of slough off prior layers of pigments as we add on glazes. If you're working with snappier synthetics, like Princeton synthetics tend to be very snappy, those are fantastic for certain types of watercolor illustration that are really brushwork dependent and you want those really crispy lines. But for something like this, where we're doing a lot of glazes and we're adding color on top of color, those will definitely scrape the pigment off your paper. So generally I try to avoid them for these kind of illustrations. So now I'm adding a little bit of alizarin crimson to create the blush. I add it to her cheeks, her nose, her lips, the underside of her chin, her fingertips, her knuckles, her elbows, her knees, anything like that. Basically where skin crosses over skin. Or if you just want to add a little bit of color for some cute, that would be a good place to add a little pop of red and add a little bit of liveliness to the illustration. So I'm using one of our greens to add just a little hint of green to the beads on the tassel. We're just kind of working in little hints of our complementary color as we work on this piece. I'm gonna use our Imelda Zone and probably a Lizard and Crimson mix. Add that to the top of her chemise just to add a little pop of color again, like it's a cute little ribbon that was sewn up there just for some color. And I'm going to use our Quinn Gold, a little bit more saturated on the trim of the dress. And like I said, don't just like fully color it in one layer on top of the other. Leave some areas of the prior layers as highlights and that's going to start to create some contrast and that's going to be more interesting for the eye to look at. One thing that I think is really important to talk about when we're talking about watercolor is patience. So if you're doing more abstract watercolor like loose florals, I think you don't need quite as much patience. It's not going to take quite as long as an illustration like this. This took a couple days of me painting in like four hour-ish ish stretches and that's including the dry time so i think it was like three hours of active painting i don't remember i shared that to my community tab so you can check me on that one but active painting is not including dry times or refreshing the water anytime i have to pause the camera i'm probably not showing it that said cartoony comic-y illustrations like this take far less time then some of the more rendered illustrations that I do on, co on cotton rag paper, they take less time than my comic pages and they take far less time than a hyper-realistic watercolor illustration. That said, you still have to be patient. You have to be patient with yourself and give yourself time to develop the color. Um, one of the big compliments my watercolor art gets, and I take it as a compliment, maybe some people don't mean it as a compliment, is how saturated my work is. People assume I work with acrylics. I don't, it's watercolor. You guys can see it's watercolor, but I put the time in to layer those colors and build up layers of those colors and build up the saturation and to remix colors and to let it dry and to paint another layer on top of it and paint another layer on top of it. And that helps build up that saturation. And I basically just keep doing it until it looks good to my eyes. It makes my brain go burr and then I'm probably gonna move on to like adding the white gouache so just kind of relax into it um don't assume 
while you're still learning, while you're still finding your footing, while you're still finding your rhythm, that it's going to take a certain set amount of time. Sometimes it takes more. Sometimes it takes less. Sometimes it takes a while to dry. Sometimes it takes no time to dry. Sometimes the colors you're working with build up really quickly. Sometimes you really have to work with them to get them to be what you want them to be. Give your art time and give yourself time. Give yourself time to take breaks. Give yourself time to come back to it the next morning with refreshed eyes. Give yourself time to look at it and self critique and look for areas that you'd like to improve while you have a chance to improve it and fix it. Watercolor takes time and I don't just mean it takes time to paint. It's all these other things are part of that time. But it's still my favorite medium to work with. It's so rewarding. I love how the colors look. I love how the paints handle. <laughs> I love basically everything about watercolor. So I don't mind that time. When I'm painting with watercolor, that's time I'm spending on myself. And you guys see, I'm taking the time to just kind of adjust the colors that you can see they've really evaporated out now. We have very little water, if any, in our ceramic wells. So I'm bringing in water from my clean water cup and I'm kind of reactivating it, which you can do if you're working with a ceramic palette here. And I'm using those more saturated tones to really bring in the contrast to add a little bit of drama. If you want to add a little bit of drama, this is not a super drama-y illustration, but if it were, that contrast would really help up the drama. It would help up the visual interest because you're creating contrast. You can create contrast with contrasting colors. You can create contrast between light and dark. You can create contrast between areas that are very simple versus areas that are very busy. You can find a lot of ways to make your illustrations either calming and relaxing to look at or very dynamic and very busy and very interesting and mentally stimulating. It's up to you. Now, if you're looking for some ideas on how to improve your art in general, Andrew Loomis has some really great books. They came out in like the 40s and the 50s. There's still a lot of really helpful information in those books. They are well worth revisiting and checking out. Some libraries have some copies. So often you can find them online, but I highly recommend his books, especially for my friends who like more pictures and they like pictures with descriptions and they like to work at their own pace. I see you friend. I'm the same way. His books are really good for that and I highly recommend you check them out and I will list them in the description for you guys so that you guys can google them and find them. At this point you guys might have noticed that I have really made the underside of her mushroom cap with the gills fairly dark considering that is facing the light source. Now that's for two reasons. One, it's the underside of the hat so it wouldn't be receiving full light. And two, I want her face to be the lighter object that's going to create contrast and it's going to pop out and stand out to the viewer a little bit more. You guys remember what I said, what I literally just said about giving your art time and giving yourself time. So I have given myself time and at this point I am just kind of adjusting things, noodling things, making some areas darker, intensifying things like the blush. I'm just kind of moving around and picking at different things and then sitting back and being like, hmm, how do I feel about this? Oh, it needs more of this. Or maybe I'll go do some chores and then come back and have kind of a fresh set of eyes and I'll see what it needs. Okay, 
Okay, so this looks basically done, right? Except I felt like it looked kind of static. I'm using a little bit of Coors Titanium Buff to add a little bit of a white rim highlight to the underside of the ruffle of her dress, but I still feel like something's missing. So I pull out the spray bottle and I spray the moss. And okay, we're getting some color movement. That's great, I want that. So I wanna encourage that. So I'm grabbing some uh, olive green, I'm grabbing some chromium green, and I'm just kind of splatting it in using my little round brush and encouraging it to move. Once that dried, I am going to just re-ink a few areas because since we were working with watercolor and some watercolors are more opaque than others, sometimes layers of those slightly more opaque colors can build up a film that can make your illustration look a little bit more muddy or a little more confused or a little hazy. And sometimes that works in your benefit and sometimes it doesn't. So I just pull out the same brush pin that I used to ink this initially just to tighten up some of the areas where I wanna bring that contrast back in. I am also using a little bit of white gouache to add some white highlights and rim lights just here and there. That's going to just kind of rebalance the contrast a little bit. It's going to clarify some things that may get lost when we have one dark color on top of another dark color. And it's going to add just a little bit more visual interest. And I am gross and I basically wet my brush and then dip it in my tube of gouache. I don't even bother trying to put it on the palette anymore more because I wasted so much gouache this way. I basically just use white gouache to add highlights though. So, you know, it is what it is and we're going to roll with it. So we have finished another start to finish sketch to finish painting illustration together with this mushroom girl. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another tutorial. I hope you guys found this helpful, useful, and informative. I hope it was inspiring and I definitely hope this was helpful in helping you make art habit because I want art to be accessible to more people and I want it to be a part of people's everyday daily lives because I genuinely think art and making art makes your life richer, makes it more fun, definitely makes it more colorful, and it makes it more enjoyable. If you guys have any more ideas for start to finish tutorials, things that you would like to see, let me know. If you're just looking to paint and you don't wanna do any drawing, I hope you guys will check out my Stash Buster tutorials. And I wanna thank my amazing patrons, their names are listed here, for their support because it is their support that enables me to do what I do here on the channel. All the funds from my Patreon go back into buying the supplies that I review. So thank you guys so, so much.